people have have some questions of, of Alan? Yes, please carry on. Raise hands so and unmute yourselves. Rodney. Hey, I. Rodney, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Alan, oh. that was e excellent, and uh, really, uh, I was very impressed with the sound as well and the quality of your presentation. I wonder if uh, you've ever felt inclined when you're behind the microphone. I wonder if you've ever felt inclined to kind of. Uh, Get in front of the microphone ever? Have you have you ever been on the other side of the microphone with the BBC? Uh, yes, uh, briefly when I was in Northern Ireland, um, I spent. Uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, I spent about six months in Northern Ireland, and I did a little bit of broadcasting there. Then it was on local radio Ulster, so it wasn't very um, very significant. But uh, I had a brief uh, of, in prior to that. I had a session with the BBC's announcer uh, training uh, uh, manager, a guy called, um, oh, his name's gone now, uh, but he was a well-known announcer actually, and he, he gave me a few hints and tips on how to <laughs> present, um, which was just prior to going to Northern Ireland. It was about, you know, an hour's lesson on how to broadcast. And going back to your... May I, just one quick one. Going back to your um, Sparty. Yes. Uh, because I remember all that stuff. Of course. <laughs> uh, but the sound that was uh, being produced there, I don't know whether it, whether it would be correct to call it a vote owner, uh, is, but it certainly um, predates uh, Jeff Lynn's uh, Mr. Blue Sky, which I think was the same, the same effect, was it not? Well, that was a vocoder, and I think, but I think that it was called um, in Sparky's day. It was called Sonovox, um, and it was a it was a device which actually, um, you it was basically a transducer, like a speaker with a tube connected to it that the uh, actor put in his mouth, and so that had the sound of the piano coming through it, and the mouth simply put its own you know coloration on the on the sound to make it sound like a voice yeah. as you know lots of guitarists have used that uh, yes that effect. Uh, well uh, yes i have i heard yes i have heard that but uh, it was i've i've never practiced i've never played with that it was quite a nice trick to play with and i i i i was it just reminded me about the sound and and hearing that originally but really it was quite some time before it really became popular in the music industry wasn't it Yes, I mean, a long time after 1950, which is when that was, uh, yeah, when yeah, I heard yeah, it. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Anyway, thanks. Yeah, I'll leave it Thank you, Kenneth. Yeah. Rodney, you, you had a question, I think. Alan. Yes, Rodney. Your 30 years, 30 yes. years with the BBC, your most memorable occasion was that in this evening's presentation. To be honest, Rodney, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's so many. It's so difficult to pick out a single memory. Um, but uh, you, you, uh, it was such a wonderful evening. You, the, the sincerity in which you presented it, the emotions that you captivated in it was absolutely wonderful. Oh, well, thank and you thank for that. You. I mean, I think that the, the Finzi has made a, made a very big impression on me. Uh, and you know that is something which uh, which, which I do class is really one of my biggest favourites. Of course, St George's Brandon Hill means a lot to me. Of course, it does. And um, I'm intrigued by the photograph. I have photographs of the interior, uh, but I don't have the one of the angle that you presented with the um, um, the Sunday service. Yes, uh, the, the organ. Concor we... Yeah, the console the, from the the angle of the the gallery. Um, I'm, I spent all my my years at St George's. Yes, I know. I was I was the last organist of St George. Yes. Before it closed down. Yes. And I would love to have that angle photograph. Well, I can send you a copy of that. It was actually found it on the St George's website. Oh, did you? Yeah. All right. Um, it's well, um, well I'll it's, do that then don't worry 
Well, I, if you I, if you I'll can't go. find it, let me know, and yeah. I'll um, and I'll you know I'll let you have it. Thank you, Alan. Lovely evening. You're Absolutely welcome. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Anybody else? Can I chip in? May Hello. I? Hello. Right. I'm I'm a bit of an interloper. I'm I'm not. I, I live in South Manchester and I, I've come in as a guest and thank you very much. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, I worked for the BBC for 10 years, not on your side, um, bizarrely on the computer side of radio. Um, I'm curious to know how, how you trained. I, I realise that you came in clearly with a deep interest, but did the BBC give you any training? Or yeah. Just learn on the job. Um, they they sent me on a, a twelve week course at Evesham to begin with. Um, that was it, I think. Um, <laughs> it was uh, it was it was a trainee technical operator course, um, and um, that was you know right in within six months of joining. Everything else was really just learnt by doing and by watching other people and by assisting. You know, when in the days when, for example. Uh, if, you, if you were making a radio program, there was somebody sitting at the control panel and there would be a tape operator playing the tapes and the records and so on. Well, that tape operator would be a trainee like me, learning by watching what, the, what his senior member was doing so that he was, you were ready to take over from him when he gave you the opportunity to do so. Now, it was a brilliant, uh, it's kind of, you know, almost a lifelong apprenticeship, really, because that happened throughout everything that I did. I learned by assisting somebody and picking it up and then doing it. Um, and everybody finds their own level. And in the BBC, of course, you have the opportunity to apply for so many different departments. You can make a complete change. I mean, I could have transferred to computers or I could have transferred to something completely different. But, uh, you know, I followed my own nose and my own path and, and, and enjoyed it all the way. That's, that's very interesting. There, there was one time when I had the opportunity to go and visit um, uh, and go to Maida Vale and see the Radiophonic Workshop and meet the people there. Oh, um, right. And, and that was absolutely brilliant and a total highlight. So I, I understand where, you, where you're coming from. Yes. Joined, we were indeed all, everybody was sent on an induction course to find out what the BBC was Yes, um, yes. That's terrific. I think it's, in many ways it was the best bit. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Nice to hear from you. Thank you very much. Eric, may I ask an, uh, another question? Malcolm yeah. waved his hand first. Yeah. Malcolm Gibbs, did you want to? Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I, I realise that over sort of the last hundred years, the BBC must have had absolutely masses of recorded um, programmes. I just wondered how they were stored. Is there any attempt, for example, to digitise the audio recordings? And and uh, obviously they're stored somewhere. And is there any, what, what sort of protection do they put on it to try and stop it going up in flames? Um, well, I can't answer the latter part of that. Um, what I can say is that, uh, of course, recording programmes for archive um, has has been very closely controlled over the over that hundred years, uh, because of course right at the beginning they recognised that if they if they stored everything they would very soon run out of space, um, and and indeed recording was viewed only as a means of assisting the schedules. In other words, it was it was recorded simply so that it could be broadcast at a time that it was convenient to place it in the schedule which was maybe suited the listeners better or whatever, got the biggest audience, whatever. But the idea of recording it because it was something worth keeping was never really in the, in the, in the mind because we, it, was, it was a broadcasting organisation, not a recording body. That was the thinking at the time, which is why so many programmes were lost. I mean, once they'd been broadcast, maybe had a repeat broadcast, uh, then they would be wiped. Uh, the tape would be wiped and reused. And... Um, and of course, there were also uh, rights considerations involved. I mean, if you'd, if you'd got a contract for one, one broadcast, one broadcast and one repeat, that was it. You couldn't broadcast it anymore. 
So as far as the BBC was concerned, once it had done that, it was it was redundant. Um, but it was only people like me who were making illicit copies of things, uh, you know, when, 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 they, when it suited us and when we'd done something we were pleased with, that, um, you know, we, 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 some of these things have, have survived. And you've probably seen um, there have been examples of uh, long lost programmes having come to light um, in things like Dad's Army, for example, where people have somehow kept copies of them in their attics and they've come to light when the owner has died or whatever and uh, that kind of thing. So th that's where the archive is. But nowadays, of course, with um, a digital storage, when everything is recorded digitally, um, uh, there's, there's much more likelihood of stuff being kept for archive. And there is, I mean, there is a BBC archive, but it's not universally accessible. Um, and I'm sure that it's, I mean, I would say that it's carefully guarded by duplicate uh, storage facilities and protection of all sorts, uh, fire and all. I don't know. I don't know. There's not some, I don't know of some secret bunker somewhere where there's you know, shelves and shelves of hard disk drives. Ken, you want to ask another question? Yeah. Um, we, we mentioned in the discussion that was going on before you started this peering question, the question of peers. And I wonder if you, in fact, suffered any hearing damage uh, as a recording engineer. Uh, it possibly. Uh, I mean, you know, you weren't doing an enormous amount of rock music and, and recording really loud, loud music, but, uh, but, but there is a history, if they're not, of um, recording engineers who start out with brilliant hearing, but end up, you know, with it damaged. I'm thinking of George Martin in particular, who was very yes. deaf by the end of his career. Yes. Um, any comment on that? Yes. Well, I can say that the BBC was actually quite good at protecting us from ourselves. Um, I mean, they they insisted that we had headphones with limiters built in, for example, and they provided them. They weren't at all popular, I have to say, and people found all sorts of ways of defeating them. Yeah. Um, and also they put signs on the loudspeakers which uh, said, you know, high sound levels, this can damage your hearing, etc. Um, which, again, people thought, yes, OK, well, that's as may be, but I can I need to hear this loud. Um, so, I mean, there, 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 there was an awareness, if not necessarily very much in the way of action. But quite a, quite a long time after I left the BBC, um, I went to see my doctor about something or other, I can't remember what, um, and he was very interested in sound, and he was a, he was a great hi-fi enthusiast, and he nearly always spent most of my co the consultation talking about loudspeakers and so on. And at one point he said, "Could I? do you mind if I booked you in for a hearing test? I said, well, all right, yeah, why not? Uh, why? And he said, well, I'd be quite interested to see, the, you know, what the effect on your hearing has been of a lifetime working in sound. So I said, oh, OK, fine, well, let's do it. So I went in for an audiogram in the, in the, in the, in the health centre. And um, when I saw him afterwards, I said, well, what did you think? And he said, it's a bit disappointing, really. It's about the same as an average 69-year-old or whatever it was. <laughs> um, so I think the answer to your question is that I don't think my hearing has been adversely affected by having worked in sound. In fact, I think it's enhanced. And I think I hear better now than I did. Uh, I, I mean, the, um, certainly I know that my hearing is deficient in the high frequencies and so on, uh, like everybody's uh, yeah. of, of our sort of age. But um, it's certainly I think my critical faculties are still OK. And I think I can still uh, uh, get a stereo image very clear, very precise, much more than I felt that I did when I was actually producing it. Uh, interesting. I mean, I, I played in a, in a rock band, and I always regard the, regarded the person who did the most damage to everybody was the drummer. Absolutely. Because of the transients. I mean, most yes. uh, most other instruments don't actually produce massive transients, so they no. can break the fibres in your cochlea. But but drummers can. So. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I learned to play the bass in my re uh, early years of retirement and played in a blues band for a bit. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Not very well. Didn't do anything. Didn't do anything very well.
about, apart from recording. But of course, it's a relatively safe instrument to play. Well, <laughs> except that you stand right in front of the drums often or next to the drum. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're at the back, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Richard. Thank you so much for this evening. I'm, I'm really interested to know how the sort of fashion um, for sound changed over your career. Um, and and what what the trend was towards colour? Did did sound get brighter? Did it get fuller, fatter, um, more bass, less bass? Can you comment on that at all? Um, well, I think I think probably the answer to that is that it's for us all to hear. I mean, we know you know what's happened in 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 the music industry over the years, and it's the trends in in music change every year, one way or another. In terms of sound, uh, and sorry, in terms of classical music, um, obviously the advent of digital recording has made a huge difference. Um, because I mean, in my day, um, I, I mean, I stopped doing it before we got into digital. I, everything I did was on magnetic tape, pretty much. Um, but um, uh, in later years, I mean, having I have got friends still in the industry. Uh, and the sort of things which uh, which they can do now, for example, the guy who does the sound for the BBC Philharmonic, um, his desk, of course, has got it's all digital, and it's got every channel's got delay lines built into it. <clears throat> so if he's multi-miking the orchestra with a stereo pair or a, a deck of tree or something for the overall image, he can then, with the spot effects, he can dial in the delay uh, occasioned by their distance from the main pair, so that they blend in perfectly seamlessly and that gives an incredibly precise image and very very natural sounding image and so that i think is a great change that's happened in the music industry in the in the classical music recording industry um can't speak much about the pop music industry because people do that mostly in their bedrooms it seems to me <laughs> or at least try to over the sort of 30 or 40 years that you worked, um, were, were you trying to engineer a particular sound or were you always chasing something that was very natural and faithful, faithfully reproduced what you were hearing in the room? Uh, the natural, the, the, well, actually, there were two things. Obviously, doing, doing rock music, working with the, for example, on the John Peel sessions, that kind of thing, you were creating something from relatively indifferent, you know, quality uh, I mean of, of playing and music you were actually you were there you were responsible for creating a sound uh, from the from the uh, musicians and you worked very closely with them whereas if you went to record the BSO for something like that or a chamber orchestra chamber uh, uh, recital then you were after recreating the sound that was being made in the venue so the two things were quite different um, and I used to think, uh, as a young man, that uh, although I preferred to listen to classical music, I used to prefer recording pop music because you had a greater contribution to make. You could create, you know, uh, I hesitate to say it, but a silk purse out of a sow's ear quite often. Um, and it was your responsibility to, to do that. And, and you, you know, you could invent things and you know, just play games with the sound. It was good fun, really. Oh, mm. good fun. Mm. Thank you. Welcome. Anything else? Anybody else like to say anything? I, oh, I've, I've raised my hand digitally, but I, I, I um, so I might not have been seen because my camera's broken. But it was fascinating, and I thought the uh, David Bowie and the um, Oh, God of Abraham were the highlights to me. I love that arrangement, full sort of Wilcox treatment given to that hymn. A lovely minor hymn. I think that not enough hymns are minor, so that's great. Oh, yes, the the the, uh, the uh, Cotton Parish Church. Yes, yeah. that was wonderful, yeah. It was uh, terrific. And uh, I, I did write in something because I wanted to say that what a thrill it is when you're sitting in a mixing desk and you open the faders and you start mixing it and something like that comes at you. It gives you a real thrill, you know, you, you think, wow, what am I doing? This is amazing. And of course, it's all created in the in the venue. It's, it's all created the other side of the microphone. You know, you, it, it, if it's not good there, it's never going to be any good when, in the loudspeakers. It was terrific. My, my question is sort of going back to what Richard was asking. Within the analog era, which was obviously your heyday, you started, was it 62? Uh, 
um, yes yeah and then all the way basically up to the 80s and, and yes just yes. to the, the sort of um twilight years of analog so um what were the technical innovations that most transformed your work in terms of whether that was multi-channel tape or more stereo capabilities what were the innovations that really opened up the world of possibilities for you well i have to say stereo because uh, when i first started um, you know working in in radio everything was mono um, and um, in the early days of stereo we had to almost kind of manufacture a stereo mixing desk uh, out of a mono one um, using different bits of the same uh, signal chain but in a in a different way i won't go into too much detail now because it's a bit technical um, but um, that was quite you know it was quite fun to experiment in those ways just to create a stereo um, sound um, that was probably the greatest innovation and, and then of course playing with stereo and you know just experimenting what you could do in the way of multi mics and uh, uh, you know how you could enhance things by mixing extra mics in and so on um, really I can't think of anything much more to say because by the time I'd by the time multitrack came in I'd moved into a management position and so um, I was unable to pursue any more experimental stuff. I just uh, had to encourage the the uh, gentlemen in my department and ladies to make the best of the new equipment. Uh, digital digital was um, just beginning. There was a product called Audiophile, which was made by AMS which was a digital recording system which I introduced into BBC and Points West to do the sound for the reports on Points West. That was the first digital recording system we had. Not a very good answer, James. No, no, was, that, that was great. No, I, uh, so, the, the, so rather, but the, uh, the takeaway from that was that actually rather, far from products or hardware coming to you um, ready to plug and play from some new factory. In fact, it was a, a lot of experimentation at your end with, um, you said, you know, kits that you had to sort of do your own DIY on rather than just sort of un unboxing something and yes. to play. There was a lot of that. Um, actually, of course, in recent years, since since I've been retired, I you know still do some recording work and um, and I do it all obviously digitally now. Um, and, and the whole business of... Uh, you know, editing, uh, whereas once upon a time it was cut and you know join um, with sticky tape, um, and that was you know quite a skill. Um, and now to be able to do it on on a computer is of course wonderful. You can do so much more and uh, get away with murder so much more easily. Um, whereas you know if you I mean, if you got a mistake if you got an edit wrong uh, on quarter inch tape. You had to get on your hands and knees and try and find the bit that you'd cut out wrongly off the floor uh, and try and stick it back together and put it back in. Didn't always happen, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, with, with digital, you just try it and if it doesn't sound right, you undo it and you know, do it again. It's dead easy, really. Um, and of course, I often wonder if people who see the word scrub on a digital editor know what that really means. And of course, in in magnetic tape terms it means scrubbing the tape backwards and forwards past the head you know with just physically even with the spools or with just little bits of magnetic tape just to see which bit you've got that's scrubbing um and uh, i'm uh, it's, it pleases me greatly that they've res they've uh, kept that in in the digital audio workstations of today as a concept Alan, well, thank you very much indeed uh, for, for fielding all those questions as well as the, uh, the, the uh, talk. It's a shall pleasure. We, shall we open up the other uh, microphones if people want to have a, a chat for sort of 10, 15 minutes?